This evening, we have a fantastic presentation for all of you. And welcome again to Dominican University of California. My name is Denise Lucy. I am a professor of business and the director of the Institute for Leadership Studies, which is the host of the Leadership Lecture Series. Each semester, we host programs like these, and we invite, of course, our great neighbors and community members to join our students and faculty to hear these great thinkers. And we have a wonderful person for you this evening. Let me just say a couple of things about the Institute. We are a leadership development center, and our goal is to, is to help people become better leaders. We seek to facilitate positive social, individual, and organizational change. And our speaker tonight is a perfect match for that mission. Tonight, our speaker, she is a political activist, an honorary co-chair of the Democratic Socialists of America. She's the author of nearly 20 books and numerous essays and once was a guest columnist for the New York Times. She studies physics at Reed College in Portland and taught writing at Cal Berkeley. She is a fighter for social change, an advocate, uh, <coughs> excuse me, an advocate for independent thinking and a breast cancer survivor. Her latest book, Bright Sided, How the Relentless Promotion of Positive Thinking Has Undermined America, once again proves how bold and fearless she is and how creative and courageous she can be. She is someone with a unique perspective and someone we should all listen and look up to. She is a humanist and we're honored to have her here with us tonight. And she wanted me to mention her moment of glory. She was on the Daily Show with Jon Stewart just a couple weeks ago. So we want to congratulate her on that. So ladies and gentlemen, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker, Barbara Enright. Um, I um, have felt very strange the whole time I was working on this book. Um, you know, somehow that seems to be mocking me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, and I'd have to explain to people, well, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a book that attacks positive thinking. And I know that sounds so twisted and mean, you know, like I was going to come out against whole grains and world peace and things like that. So I have to um, defend myself a little bit by uh, explaining I am not against having a nice day. Um, <laughs> or smiling at strangers, or partying. In fact, um, one of my most recent books is a historical book called um, Dancing in the Streets, A History of Collective Joy. So you can't call me a sourpuss. I wrote the book on joy. <laughs> and I just want to get that clear. Uh, in this book, Bright Sided, is going after the, Amer the specifically American ideology of positive thinking, which is so prevalent we barely even notice it anymore. Uh, it's the idea that you really have to be positive, upbeat, and cheerful at all times. And if you are not positive, upbeat, and cheerful, then you better work on yourself so you get really positive, upbeat, and cheerful. Uh, now, I first encountered this, um, this kind of mandatory positive thinking eight years ago when I was being treated for breast cancer. Uh, the diagnosis had been a complete uh, shock. Not only did I have no known risk factors, I thought you had to have breasts to have breast cancer, but <laughs> apparently not. And um, my... My first thought, you know, being, being a, uh, a feminist involved in the women's health movement for, for many years, was to reach out to other women for support uh, and information. I, and I know there are men who get breast cancer too, but, you know, primarily it is a female disease. And so I thought, well, okay, I will reconnect with, you know, I'll connect with people who are going through this too and get the kind of moral support I need. That is not what I found, though, as I waded out into the websites and the books and the things like that that were available to me. First thing I found, um, and this sounds really treasonous to say this on, in Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but pink ribbons everywhere. Uh, and there was a moment when I was waiting for the diagnosis. I was in the radiologist's office and, and in the waiting room. 
and I came across in, the, in a local newspaper an ad for a pink breast cancer teddy bear. And then I had this like, huge existential revelation. Uh, I realized I am not afraid of dying. I am terrified of dying with a pink teddy bear tucked under my arm. <laughs> I mean, it just seemed to trivialize the whole thing so much. A, there is a lot, and I'm going to mention in other cases, a real infantilization that cancer patients, uh, probably especially breast cancer patients, encounter. For example, there, was a, um, there is a foundation in New York City that a few years ago anyway was giving out tote bags to women undergoing treatment. And I managed to get hold of one of these tote bags and it contained, oh, some cheap rhinestone jewelry and some cologne and all kinds of moisturizers and little things like that. And a box of crayons. So I called the foundation and I said, it's really nice, you know, that you're giving people this tote bag and all these nice little presents, but What's with the crayons? And she answered, well, that's in case you have some thoughts or feelings you'd like to jot down. And I said, I'm a writer. We don't use crayons. You know, it was, it was I can't explain how insulting this seemed to me. Men are treated with a little more dignity, I think, at least when they're diagnosed with prostate cancer. They're not given gifts of matchbooks, uh, matchbox cars. But the other thing I found, in addition to this uh, pink ribbon stuff, um, and by the way, in case you think I am completely around the bend for being critical of the pink ribbons, you know you have a fine organization in the Bay Area called Breast Cancer Action. And I hope there's somebody here from Breast Cancer Action. Barbara. All right, well, that's Barbara Brenner, the uh, executive director of Breast Cancer Action. And I'm going to call on you when we get to the Q&A to, to talk about what you're doing to fight the pink. Um, <laughs> and see, I'm not the only Grinch out here, all right? Uh, the other thing I found in addition to this uh, culture was uh, an insistence on mandatory optimism, constant exhortations to be positive about your disease to the point of embracing it as a gift. For example, there is a book I read called, uh, written by a woman who had had cancer, The Gift of Cancer, A Call to Awakening, um, which tells, uh, tells you how you will get closer to God through having breast cancer. You can even order a t-shirt that says, thank you, cancer. Uh, if you'd like to wear that. Now, I just want to say, for any of you who might think of cancer as a gift, take me off your Christmas list, <laughs> all right? Um, as an experiment, out somewhere along the line, I posted a um, statement on the Komen Foundation message board. Komen Foundation is the richest, biggest breast cancer organization in the country. And I posted something under the subject line, angry. I don't think it was an insane rant, uh, but I did, I pointed out problems I was having with my insurance company. Then more, more generally, I said, um, why don't we know the cause of this disease? We have an epidemic of a disease we know is a disease of industrialized nations. We don't know the cause of it. You know, what's, what's wrong with that? And thirdly, um, why are the treatments so barbaric? I mean, as a, as a uh, uh, former science person, I find it ridiculous that you, chemotherapy, you kill all the cells in the body that, that are dividing and hope that you get the cancer cells in the process while you wipe out so much of the rest of the, the body. Um, the response I got to my posting was, um, <laughs> Get over it, Barb. One woman wrote and said, you need to run, not walk, to get some counseling. And it was in, insane to express this anger. And I under, came to understand that that was well intended because the dogma has been that the positive attitude 
will actually help you get better. It will help you overcome your cancer. And that is extended to all other cancers too, and I'm sure that there are many people who've had cancer experiences right here who have heard this kind of thing too. Um, how does a positive attitude fight cancer? Well, we've heard this so often, it's gonna, you have to concentrate on it, it'll go right by you. Supposedly, the positive attitude boosts the immune system so that the immune system can fight the cancer. Well, I happen to have a PhD in cellular immunology. You don't mess with me with these statements about the immune system. So for, if, for working on bright-sided, um, I you know, researched this and I found, as I suspected, there's no evidence that the immune system fights cancer, nor should it. The immune system exists to protect our bodies from microbes, foreign invaders. Cancer cells are your own body cells gone crazy. The immune system doesn't recognize them as foreign. Not that someday it might be enlisted to help there. Secondly, there is no clear evidence that a positive attitude boosts the immune system. We do know, because so many laboratory animals have been tortured to make this point over the decades, that extreme stress wrecks the immune system and an entire body. Now, I'm not saying there's no mind-body connection, but the one that we have uh, imagined is not there. Um, more directly to the point, there are new studies out as of just uh, the last two years that are meta-studies that look at all the other studies uh, looking at, at, at uh, attitude and cancer survival rates, and they have found that there is no evidence for any uh, you know, extension of longevity or a greater survival rate um, for positive, quote, positive people as defined in these studies, whether it's breast cancer, lung cancer, neck cancer, throat cancer, it's just not there. This has been a myth. But there I was in 2001 being told, essentially, that if I didn't recover, it was gonna be my own fault because I wasn't positive enough. Now that was my first encounter with the mandatory positive thinking of our culture. I sort of, I put that out of my mind for a few years because it just seemed so bizarre and I didn't maybe want to keep thinking about the breast cancer experience. But then I began to see that more and more, and more, and more ways in which this enters our culture particularly around the kind of economic issues that have so uh, consumed me as a writer and a researcher. Uh, for example, it's possible that some of you are not rich. I don't know about Marin County, but it's just possible, you know, that uh, uh, some of you aren't. Well, for you, there are hundreds of self-help books, uh, probably not all of them at Book Passage, uh, on, on how you can attract money to yourself with your thoughts. Uh, you know, don't try saying, well, I, my wages are low, that's my problem, or I'm unemployed, or my medical bills are destroying my life. Don't, those are excuses in the universe of positive thinking. It's really you, up to you, to attract the wealth to yourself. In fact, in the last uh, decade and a half, a whole industry grew up in this country to promote the kind of positive thinking that would bring you success in the world. Uh, usually it's called the motivation industry. You can buy the books, you can buy the CDs, the DVDs, you could uh, pay for a, to go away on a weekend uh, with some heavy hitting motivational speaker like James Arthur Ray. You probably know about that, you know what happened, right? This was in uh, a couple of weeks ago in he had a bunch of people uh, there to master his principles of harmonic wealth to you know, bring that, those wealth vibrations, you get yourself into harmony with the wealth vibrations in the world. And um, tragically, uh, three people died in the sweat lodge part of the weekend experience uh, that they each had they paid about $9,600 for. Or if you don't have the money for one of those weekend inversion experiences or something, you might just want to buy some products or tchotchkes 
There's a company called Successories, <laughs> and it, that's what all it makes is little things you can put on your desk, little bean bags that will remind you to be positive, and inspirational posters. We've all seen those inspirational posters. They have a beautiful scene, and you know at the bottom something about life is a journey, etc. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's also um, uh, I don't know why this irritates so, me so much. The the, the line of products now, uh, the Life is Good line of products, seen them? Well, you know, I'm not going to argue with that proposition, but I just don't quite understand the mentality uh, behind needing to state that on the tire cover of your, of your Jeep. Life is good. What? Because I've got a Jeep, you know, and it's, it's T-shirts, it's everything. Everything for your house can say life is good. Uh, I was in the grocery store in Alexandria, Virginia, where I live now, and I noticed the guy behind me was wearing a t-shirt saying, life is crap. <laughs> I thought, my man, you know, what a pickup line. It's amazing. Um, now, one of the big problems is this positive attitude is not always voluntary at all. Those who do not reach out to embrace positive thinking may uh, find it imposed upon them one way or another. The biggest source of this is the American corporate workplace. Uh, they, that's where you will find the motivational speakers brought in. You can listen to them for free rather than paying to go away with them. You know, the, the, work, the company may give, you, may give out books like Who Moved My Cheese. All of this starts with the era of downsizing in the 1980s when they started downsizing not just the blue collar workforce but the white collar workforce and the whole positive thinking you know industry the motivational industry provided a way to quell dissent among those people who were being eliminated because you know they you send them to an outplacement firm where they get all these pep talks about what a wonderful transition they're going through now uh, and also to extract more work from the survivors of layoffs. Because they're left behind. Now they have to do the work of two or three people. So they need lots of pep talks like this. Um, you, so that's, when I began to see that going on, it really, it all came together for me. Um, the, the, the breast cancer case and these economic cases, the workplace cases, is you take people who are going through a really rough patch in their lives, and you tell them, first of all, it's not a misfortune at all. It's an opportunity. You know, that um, why is cancer a gift, for example? It's supposed to make you more spiritual, evolved, sensitive. Uh, it made me actually meaner, nastier, shallower. <laughs> but that's another thing. Uh, just as a job, when you lose a job, you're supposed to think of that as an opportunity now for you know, the truly great job to come along. Then you tell them that they can actually fix their situation through positive thinking, like cure cancer. It can um, help you get another job. And there's actually some truth to that because increasingly American employers don't look for skills or experience. They look for attitude. They do not want people in the workplace, we're going to drag other people down, so-called negative people, meaning essentially people who ask too many questions or raise doubts now and then. Uh, that became a big theme in the positive thinking business literature in the, in the last uh, decade, is get rid of the negative people in your workforce. Uh, do not have them drag down the mood or anything. There is a, a, a pretty horrifying analogy in the breast cancer world, which I have just learned about, is that some breast cancer support groups have actually expelled m women in them when their cancer is metastasized. Because at that point, it would be such a downer to be around that person. So, got to get rid of it. That's too negative. Get rid of her. Um, now, that's the you know, ways in which this is mandatory, but there's also the carrot. You know, the big incentive to positive thinking is that you can control the universe with your mind. 
you can have anything you want by focusing your mind on it. And using your thought vibrations, uh, you can ask about this if you want, but it's all quantum physics. <laughs> and send out your thought vibrations to bring the money back to you. Um, in fact, they, it, uh, several of these uh, big shot uh, motivational gurus refer to the universe as a big mail order department. It's waiting for your orders. Send in your order in a clear way and you'll get your stuff back in a timely fashion. This was the premise of the 2006 book, The Secret, which was a runaway bestseller. Did anybody read it? Yeah, you did. You're just embarrassed. <laughs> uh, no. and, you know, and she, um, she tells all kinds of stories of people attracting things through sheer powers of mind. My favorite is the story of a woman who wants to attract a man but decides not to do it with the, you know, cosmetic uh, route or anything like that. She clears out half of her closet in her bedroom, and she clears out half of her, her garage, and then she says, thank you, universe, for sending this guy. And sure enough, some poor sucker got attracted. It's by that garage and that, that closet. I think I know him. I think I lived with him once. Um, and... Um, <laughs> You know, that, but that's the idea. Just assume it's going to happen. Once you start attracting the money to yourself, you might as well start spending it. Now, how to attract money to yourself, I will give you the, uh, the, the tool, the technique here from a book called Secrets of the Millionaire Mind, which was a business success book, uh, a bestseller um, business success book in the early OOs. And uh, the author says, here's how you do it. Now I'm quoting him. Place your hand on your heart and say, I admire rich people. <laughs> I bless rich people. I love rich people. And I'm going to be one of those rich people too. And you say this every day over and over, you know, until the money comes pouring in. If you're a Christian evangelical, you might want to use God as an intermediary in getting whatever you want. Um, it, it, to, I to discovered, to my surprise, that the megachurch phenomenon in the United States is not about the old fire and brimstone kind of Protestantism. It is entirely about how God wants you to be rich. It's all upbeat. If you go, I went to the biggest megachurch in America, uh, Joel Osteen's megachurch in Houston. It, 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 can, it can hold 40,000 people on a Sunday. You will not see a cross anywhere in that church or in that sanctuary, except in the gift shop, actually. Um, you, there would be no images of Jesus, no um, crucifixes, nothing like that. Why? The story of Jesus being tortured on the cross for our sins is a bummer. You do not talk about that. That's all been shoved aside. You know, this is um, called Christianity Light by some critics. And the biggest critics are themselves Christ uh, Christians. Uh, that, that, you know, that God essentially exists to serve you, uh, to meet your every needs, a per kind of personal assistant. Now, you may be wondering, and people have asked me this a lot, so what's wrong with positive thinking, even if it's delusional? I mean, isn't it happy? You know, why begrudge anybody some happiness if they think that they're going to attract lots of money and great jobs to themselves or good health or something? Why begrudge that to them? Well, I'm going to have a couple of things wrong with it. One, I take a hard line on delusion. Um, I, you know, I don't know, my scientific background. But I would say delusion is always dangerous. And the big example here in the case of positive thinking is the financial meltdown of 08. Uh, many things fed into that. You know, that was not just one cause, greed and exotic financial instruments and all sorts of things. But the American habit of positive thinking was so much a part of that. I mean, you can count like on one hand the economists 
who were willing to say in 2005 that there was something scary going on with the levels of debt individuals and families were accumulating and the extreme inequality between the rich and the poor that was, has been growing up in America. Uh, in fact, we have economists telling us housing prices can only go up, like as if that were some new law of physics. And I think this, this, this had an effect on many ordinary people. Uh, pe what, you know, in what kind of frame of mind you get way overextended with your debts? Well, in a positive frame of mind, right? That you're going, you know, bad things aren't going to happen. You're not going to lose your job or get sick and be unable to pay off that debt. And people in the, the congregations of uh, some of the positive preachers like Joel Osteen, Preflow Dollar, Joyce Meyer, T.D. Jakes, you know, are not wealthy people. And when they heard this, this kind of um, message from the pulpit, and then somebody came along and said, you want to own a house? Do we have a mortgage for you? We're not interested in down payments or any proof of um, income or anything. Look, mortgage, magic. It must have seemed to many people like God was just reaching down to help from them. But mostly for, for the financial meltdown, I, I blame the, um, the high levels of delusion within even the high levels of the corporate culture in America. Um, there, this had permeated the corporate culture. The idea of attracting things to yourself with thoughts uh, rather than doing things. Um, uh, the the um, idea that we need always to be whipped up into a state of manic enthusiasm or optimism. Countrywide Mortgage, for example, the company whose wild lending practices almost single-handedly precipitated the um, subprime crisis, it has been described by a former vice president uh, as, as being like a cult, you know, full of high fives and woo woos all the time. You know, you, you could not say a negative thing. He was told uh, not, you know, not to keep bringing up questions about possible defaults on the subprime uh, mortgages. I found people who, in the corporate world, Wall Street insiders even, who would talk to me, which is not easy, and they all, they all concurred on this. They said, if you voiced negativity within the finance industry in the middle of this decade, you were out. You could not let, you know, that was not wanted. And the, my favorite example is the man who ran the real estate division of Lehman Brothers, who in 2006 went to his CEO and said it looked to him like this was a bubble, the housing bubble, and that they better adjust their business plan accordingly. So the CEO fired him. You don't want to hear that kind of thing. Of course, Lehman Brothers doesn't exist anymore. Um, and again and again, I mean, this was the rule. You do not want to be the bearer of bad news. So you get a corporate culture that exists in its own happy bubble of ignorance because anybody who might be raising doubts or questions has been purged. The, I have another problem with uh, the positive thinking ideology. I think it's not only delusionary and therefore foolish, but it's cruel. It's unkind. Finally, some people in the cancer care industry are beginning to speak out, for example, against the expectation that cancer patients always have a smiley face, you know, that, uh, that be, be completely positive about it. And uh, saying things like, this is, it adds an additional burden. It's bad enough to be really ill or terminally ill or whatever, but to then lay on top of that person the idea that they've got a second problem in their heads that they've got to work on if they want to survive. You know, some oncology nurses are, you know, rebelling against this now. You can see the, the, the huge indifference um, to, um, I, you know, I, I see it as a lack of compassion and, uh, entirely, but in a comment that the author of The Secret made about the tsunami of 2006. And you know, why, why could that, how could that happen? How could whatever it was 
200,000 people just be, you know, drowned like that in the tsunami? How could that happen? Her explanation, and this is um, more or less paraphrasing, is that they had to be sending thoughts out into the universe that were vibrating on the same frequency as a tsunami. In other words, they attracted that tsunami to themselves with these tsunami-like thoughts. Um, and the same, you know, it's, it's cruel to victims of economic hard times. It's not your attitude that meant you, you're, you were laid off. Uh, you, it, it, you're not poor because you're resisting wealth and have to keep, you know, repeating those affirmations. I, I get a little frustrated when I meet or read about uh, people laid off in this recession who will tell about, you know, the hardships they're going through now and then say, it's hard, but I try to stay positive. And I want to shake them and say, you don't have to stay positive. You're allowed to be angry. What's happening to you is terrible. You know, don't, don't try to pretend otherwise. Now, the alternative to positive thinking is not negative thinking. That can be another delusion. Uh, if you, I mean, I know people like this. Um, <laughs> I could mention past husbands and all kinds of people here, but you know, anything, you know, who uh, predict that anything they do is going to fail or anything they undertake isn't going to be any fun, and you know, and that, that is delusional too, just like predicting that everything will go your way at all times. Uh, the trick, the radical alternative I would like to propose is not, you know, either positive or negative thinking, but realism. I know that's radical. Just trying to figure out what is happening in the world as far as we can, and that's not easy. Try to understand what are the forces that have reduced our, you know, reduced so many people to poverty in the last couple of years and so on. What, what, uh, what's causing global warming, et cetera, et cetera, and what do we do about it? Which usually means, you know, building social movements for change or getting together in some way, not just sitting at home and reciting affirmations. Uh, I've been asked by friends, uh, good people, progressive people, well, but how, how are you going to have a movement for change if you don't get people all motivated and pumped up with optimism. Doesn't all this positive thinking, isn't that what's required to have, um, to make change historically? And I would say, no. There is something else that drives historical change, that drives social movements, that is not positive thinking. And that is determination. Determination with some hard work and courage thrown into it. And I'll give you an example from American history. Um, I'm not a real founding father's maven, but it does impress me that when they signed the Declaration of Independence, they had no reason to believe they could win a war against England. And they had every reason to believe they would be beaten Nobody was saying, hey, let's all get pumped up, you know, let's send independence vibrations into the universe and it'll come to us. No. They also knew individually that by signing that declaration, each and every one of them was making himself liable to the charge of treason to be punished by hanging. And they did it anyway. You know, that is another spirit where you say, yeah, this is hard. Yes, our chances are small, but you know what? We're gonna do it or we're gonna die trying. Thank you. First of all, thank you for Nickel and Diamond and Global Woman and all the other wonderful books that cast oh, light you. in dark places. I'm a high school teacher and I'm daring to show my students network with Peter Finch from the mid-70s. And so much of what you've talked about tonight is echoed in that, as far back as that. And then, in speaking with the students, we start talking about Horatio Alger and this 
story goes a long way back. I'm wondering if you see the recent development of the positive thinking industry as being something that's burgeoned because of its um, becoming an industry. The, the cultural trend seems to have been there for a very long time, much earlier oh, yes. than the 80s. Yeah, one of the, my favorite parts of the research for this book, um, silly as this book looks and this, is um, on the history. Uh, and I trace it in, into the 19th century. You see, really even the early 19th century. And I'm very sympathetic to the originators of it. Uh, because they were re rebelling against the dominant Calvinism of their time. Calvinist Protestantism said, you're all wretched sinners. 99.9% um, .9 of you are going to spend eternity in hell. And this really got people down. You know, it caused like epidemics of invalidism and neurasthenia. And so there were some interesting, not formally educated people, uh, one of whom was Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, who said, no, I, I, don't think the, I don't think God hates us. I think things look a little better than that. And went about trying to heal people from this re religiously imposed depression that way. It's in the 20th century that this all turns in, goes more and more into, the, into, into American business and into being a business itself. How much did this, do you think that this closed, uh, this closing off of any negative thinking had to do with the, the encapsulation of the bubble that became the Bush administration? <laughs> Good question. Very much. Um, George W. Bush um, was a cheerleader in college, and I think he <laughs> defined the presidency as a continuation of that role. I mean, he would say, that's my job, to motivate and to you know, provide optimism for other people. So everything was going to remember the, the uh, Iraq, the cakewalk, et cetera, mission accomplished, all of that. Uh, Condoleezza Rice told Bob Woodward, a little late, uh, I, I think, but she said, um, no, I had my doubts about Iraq, but you couldn't, you couldn't say them in front of the president because he hated pessimists. You know, to raise a doubt was to be a pessimist, to be a negative thinker. So they had encapsulated themselves in a bubble, and they were almost proud of it. Remember Karl Rove uh, attacking uh, journalists as being part of the reality-based community? Anybody else here in the little reality-based community, you know? I would, we have our little secret handshakes and stuff. Um, they were, you know, that, that, that was pretty blatant. Uh, to say, you know, there's a new way things are running. It's magical thinking. And we've got the power. We can do it. Oh, by the way, before I leave George W. Bush, he is now a motivational speaker. <laughs> uh, a lot, you know, and it'll be great. I mean, you could probably go to him. He, he's going to be at these Get Motivated seminars that occur all over the country. And probably, if you go there, you could find out how to replace the job you lost and the 401ks and everything else. Um, have George W. explain how. What do you think of the Dalai Lama and the art of happiness, and particularly the scientists who are kind of in his shadow, who are trying to establish what is essentially positive thinking as uh, good for your mind and your body. I'm all the way back here. Where are here. you? Oh. oh, here I am. Oh, there you are, okay. <laughs> what do I think of the science? Deep, well, deep, both deep. the Dalai Lama and the art of happiness, because it strikes me it's very much in the uh, vein of the power of positive thinking. And there are a whole lot of scientists whose mission, who admire the Dalai Lama, and their mission is to prove neurophysiologically and psychologically that he's right. Yes. Um, I have probably one of the most controversial chapters of this book is a very critical look at, quote, positive psychology, which is the academic wing of all this. Uh, it, uh, I find, you know, I, that it, 
I don't want to be too harsh here, but you know, it's it's great to have a science, to, you know, to scientifically study uh, things like happiness or joy. We don't have to have all of psychology be about neurosis and suffering. I'm, you know, with them on that, but they have been so eager to establish that happiness or whatever, a positive, you know, it's different uh, things in different studies, or a positive attitude uh, will actually make you healthier and live longer, that I think they, the science has gotten way too sloppy on that. And I just go through some of, the, some of those studies that they uh, went through. I mean, I have another problem with all that, though. Um, do we need to justify happiness because it's good for us? I mean, what a strange idea. I mean, that how Calvinistic are we to say, yeah, I gotta work on getting happier because I know it would improve my longevity. Happiness is a goal in itself. Joy is a goal in itself. Uh, making other people happy is a goal in itself. So I, I find the whole thing uh, a strange enterprise, and I'm highly critical of it. And no doubt we'll be debating many of these people soon. <laughs> I don't get it with the Dalai Lama, though, frankly. And I, here I'm, so, I'm, speak, I'm being perfectly honest about my ignorance. Buddhism does say that this life is suffering. Uh, why is he smiling all the time? <laughs> you know, I don't know. There are different religious takes, you know. I mean, Catholicism, um, and I'm not just pandering to the hosts here, uh, re recognize that, you know, sees a redeeming aspect in suffering, that in the suffering that one goes through in one's own life, you in some, you in some way are it's an imitation of the suffering of Jesus, and it uplifts you. Now, I'm not down with that myself. I'm just saying there are many different takes philosophically and religiously on the problem of human suffering and happiness. I'm very curious um, what you're offering as an alternative. Uh, so I hear you um, really objecting to the trivialization that is inherent in positive thinking and in the obfuscation of truth and the, in the, in the uh, um, resistance to hearing and entertaining dissent, diverse perspectives, and, and anything that would challenge the, the sort of the sermon of the moment. However, I'm curious in, in really the underlying message, I don't really hear you saying that being positive is wrong. And so I'm curious, first of all, what your real request is and what the alternative is to sort of its delusionally positive approach that you're objecting to. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a little semantic problem here, which I have run into many times, is that po the word positive is used almost interchangeably with the word good in our culture. Isn't it, you know, we just, we just you know, they, they seem to be synonyms almost. Um, so it, it, it's, um, is it good to be happy? You know, it's like asking a question like that, of course. It's almost, it's a tautology as far as I'm concerned. But I am, so I am trying to identify an ideology that has taken over American institutions and that has these two big problems, one, it's delusional and dangerous, and two, it is cruel and it blames the victim and it sweeps problems under the, you know, out of sight. But it's an ideology here. You can smile, we can all smile. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, as I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm for more smiling at strangers and hugging people and uh, having a good time. She doesn't believe me. No, she doesn't. Yeah, you know, I can tell. Your book, Nickel and Dime, which is a fantastic book, and, and I, I'm trying to picture you, you know, working in the, in the uh, hotels and fixing the beds, and I don't get the picture here, but uh, 
but there, there was a woman in that book who uh, was inspiring because she was po trying to be positive in the face of what you saw was a hopeless, uh, painful uh, life predicament. So I guess, uh, I guess I'd like to know a little bit, if, if you could just speak briefly about that book and a little bit about that and, and the positivity you saw in people's um, uh, lives there that might have helped them cope with how painful and difficult their life was. Well, again, I wouldn't say positivity. There are many ways that people c were coping or dealing, um, but I, I found them to be ways that were not too terribly constructive. Very com a very common thing was just, uh, you know, a little act of defiance, making fun of the boss behind his back, um, mimicking him behind his back while he was talking. Um, driving around a wealthy neighborhood. This is with the maid service that I worked with, uh, you know, the car full of um, women who clean houses. With the windows all rolled down, blasting out truly obscene rap lyrics into this upscale neighborhood. I mean, and we're all laughing our heads off, of course. So I guess I'm saying defiance and laughter are part of it. Now, I also, you know, one of the women I worked with and have and remain in touch with is is uh, a, a evangelical Christian uh, who is goes to a mega church and I suppose that is a source of uh, some support to, to her. Uh, although I, you know, I do worry these mega churches demand a lot of money. Uh, there you you can go and not pay, but if you want God to give you stuff you better tithe to the church more and more. That's your seed that you plant that brings you the good stuff, is the money you give. And I, I feel bad about this woman on Walmart wages um, giving the amount she must give to a church. I wanted at some point if um, Barbara Brenner would say something about uh, a different look at cancer and um, because when I was when I was going through this, um, and, and maybe this makes will make more real some of the things I've been saying that uh, I really felt very very isolated until I discovered Breast Cancer Action. There were my sisters. <laughs> so do you want to say? I mean, wh why why are you against the pink ribbon stuff? And what what does it mean to you for you to take on cancer? realistically. Let me just say we have a campaign called Think Before You Pink and you can find it online. And basically we think breast cancer is being exploited by corporate America. We've been saying this for years. Companies put pink ribbons on a product because they want you to buy the product because you care about breast cancer. Do you know where the money goes? Do you have any idea? And if you don't, join the club. So we want people to start asking questions. And we particularly want them to ask questions about whether the pink ribbon on the product is intended to delude you into thinking that the product is not bad for your health. So you'll think the company's a good company when they're trying to kill us <clears throat> in the process. Mm -hmm. Those are pink washers. <laughs> and the leader currently is a company called Eli Lilly, which is milking cancer. I, I really want you to visit this website. Basically, we think the truth is more helpful than the fictions. And we really want people to know what's really happening in cancer. We're losing 40,000 women a year to breast cancer, no matter how much happy face we put on it. And there's a new diagnosis every two minutes. So let's get a grip. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you spoke about uh, the different institutions in, in the United States. And you focused on our corporate institutions as well as our religious institutions. I'm curious, what did you find in our school systems and our prison systems? Is there a positive movement in San Quentin and, um, or in our public schools? And how is that impacting um, these what individuals? What an interesting question. I know of one effort um, to bring positive thinking into prisons. Uh, there is a pastor uh, in Kansas who um, outlawed complaining he created the first complaint-free church uh, where, and, and what he does is you can send for uh, a, a, one of those Lance Armstrong type bracelets and you put that on and that's your pledge not to complain 
And every time you do break it and complain, you have to change to the other wrist and go back and forth. Uh, some people like to sort of hurt themselves, you know, snap themselves with a bracelet whenever they have a negative thought even. But um, this pastor um, has ambitions that um, this should be a big thing in prisons. That, you know, you just stop the you know, complaint. Just, you know, look at the really bright side of your situation <laughs> there in jail. And the, in schools, um, there's an active effort on the part of the positive psychologists, the academic types, to bring optimism training into schools, into the public schools. They've done quite a bit of that, strangely, in England. Uh, I think more so than here. Uh, and a part of this, again, goes to the uh, idea, it goes to ideas about poverty and why are people poor? Because they have bad attitudes, because they, um, you know, don't focus on their goals and uh, visualize and, you know, attract these things to themselves. So you have to start with them as children, teaching them all, the, all that. So, yeah, it is, it's, um, it's moving everywhere, yeah. Um, are you a teacher? No, I'm not. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Although I just would throw in, you know, one, there's so many, one study found, um, I think it was done with California school children, that uh, high school kids, that the ones who were most realistic about how popular or unpopular they were were far less likely to fall into depression and self-destructive habits than those who had greatly exaggerated their notion of, you know, had, had a blown up idea of how popular they were. Uh, the, the realism, you know, might be a good thing even for a teenager, the idea. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight and <laughs> nice talking to you.